Uh, hello, everyone, and good day. Um, as Laura said, I'm Greg Williams from DQ Systems, and I appreciate you taking uh, time out of your busy day um, to listen and discuss a little bit about the return on investment of accessibility. Uh, first, a little bit about myself. Um, I've worked in the IT industry for over 30 years, and for about the last seven years of that, I've focused um, on accessibility. Um, I do come from a Fortune 40 company, and at that Fortune 40 company, I had the privilege to be able to um, found and mature the accessibility program there and bring it to a very high state of maturity, um, at which point I decided to move from that company over to DQ so that I could help um, programs and companies around the world achieve similar results. So something near and dear to my heart, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity from DQ to talk about this, and we'll go ahead and get started. So the return on investment of accessibility, you know, what, what do we talk about when we say that? And, and I say here the examples of helping to improve your bottom line. You know, traditionally, accessibility is looked at as a, as a cost center for businesses. And it's something that you need to do. It's something you need to do to make sure that you're including all of your customers. And typically, uh, people see it as, as disruptive to the development cycle and disruptive to the ability to get new features and function out. And so, they, they tend to count that cost without thinking about the other side um, of the balance beam, so to say. And specifically within that, um, we also see a, a unique and, and I'll say well-earned focus on risk mitigation. And when I say risk mitigation, I'm talking about, you know, making sure that you don't have costly complaints or costly litigation. Um, we're going to talk in a minute about how we've seen just an explosion in litigation in the last couple of years and how much it can actually cost to field those. So always a lot of focus on that. And typically when people build their business cases, they're talking about how do I manage my enterprise risk? How do I avoid complaints of litigation? And you know, what is the, you know, what are the dollar figures that come from doing something like that? But when we focus on that single aspect of return on investment, we're really missing some some very big positive factors that come from having an accessible digital presence. And those positive factors can really end up helping you control costs to the point that the accessibility efforts can pay for themselves. And if it's really done right, accessibility can certainly become a competitive advantage, especially in the e-commerce marketplace. So I like to think of four different aspects of return on investment. The first one would be increasing your market share and gaining e-commerce traffic. Um, the second one where it definitely helps is controlling operational costs, especially in an omnichannel organization. And when I say omnichannel, I mean an organization that strives to give the customer a seamless and interactive experience across the different channels. So say a brick and mortar um, bank or retail um, center, along with a call center and the digital presence, um, as well as other avenues that they may use to reach out to their customers and transact business. The third one we'll talk about is managing your risk profile to avoid those, those complaints and litigation. So this is what I, I talked about in the beginning. And then finally, aligning your digital presence with your company core values. And this is one that I don't see talked about very often, but is becoming more and more important in today's world. So the first one we're gonna talk about is we're gonna talk about market share in e-commerce. And I say claim your portion of the pie. And it's really become evident as people continue to do research in these spaces that the portion of the pie that's related to the people with disabilities community is large. It's not a small percentage of our population and it's not a small percentage of the disposable income of our population either. In fact, there was a study out a couple of years ago, um, actually last year I think it was, that uh, lends some market share size to the people with disabilities community of working age adults. And then recently, DQ has commissioned a study through Nucleus Research, um, really focusing on people who are blind to look at some additional e-commerce and, and market share perspective and how those people are able to interact and, and purchase and spend money in e-commerce. So the study I talked about first, there's, there's one out there and all the references for all this data and information are in the slide deck, I, I believe at the very end. So, if you wanna go out and read these things yourself, I certainly encourage you to do that, but that's where all of this data comes from throughout the entire presentation. But when we talk about you know, people and money involved, especially when we talk about people 
with disabilities and in working age adults. We have seen that the market share is about $490 billion. Um, and we also have a, an image here on the, on the right side of the slide that then breaks down some of that discretionary income by state. So we look at discretionary income um, as the money that people you know, have to spend after their, their other bills and things and, and cost of living is taken care of. And all that's defined in that study as well that you can check out. For comparison's sake, the African-American market segment is $501 billion. And the Hispanic market segment is $582 billion. So we certainly don't hear in boardrooms around the com company or around the country, you know, people saying, well, you know, it's going to cost a lot to reach out to the African-American market segment or the Hispanic market segment. So, you know, maybe maybe we want to put that on the back burner or maybe we want, to, we want to think about, you know, different ways to do it to minimize our investment because they know that, you know, we're talking about billions of dollars. <clears throat> and so now um, for the first time, really, we have a good idea that the people with disabilities uh, market segment is very similar to those. And so I certainly would expect people to look at this data and say, this is really something that we, you know, have to fulfill if our mission is to serve everyone and our mission is to, you know, expand the company and, and create shareholder value. We have to look at these large market segments and that includes doing accessibility. In fact, <clears throat> there are 20 million U.S. working age adults, so that's 35 percent, with who report at least one disability. And again, this information is taken from several sources in that study, uh, some census and other information that you can check out to see there. But lots of people and money involved in, in really a compelling story for expanding your market share, no matter what type of business you do. Additionally, we can look across and see for the different types of disability. So from vision, hearing, uh, self-care, ambulatory, cognitive, and independent living difficulty, where some of that income um, resides. Um, there's a slide up on the screen now, and for that slide, we've got uh, vision, all those ones that I just mentioned across. Um, independent living difficulty is the, the largest one at 140 billion. Uh, Self-care is the smallest at about 5 billion. But then we've got vision, hearing, ambulatory, and cognitive spread across you know, somewhere between 40 billion and, and 120 billion dollars. And again, remember this is disposable income. So significant amount, amounts of money out there across the people with disabilities community. Now talking more specifically um, about market share and then adding in e-commerce to that. So uh, as I mentioned, DQ has commissioned a study by Nucleus Research and Nucleus Research surveyed a group of people with uh, vision difficulties or people who are blind and, and gave us some more compelling information here as well. So e-commerce revenues in North America uh, for 2018 totaled approximately $517 billion. Based on the research that Nucleus did, they found that 2% of total e-commerce transactions are completed by people who are blind. And this 2% of total is really assuming less than half of the 5% of, of the population um, who is reported to be blind. So we're not looking at you know, the best case numbers here. We're actually taking some smaller numbers you know, based on what we, we were able to, to gain in the research and the surveys that were done. So the total available market here is about $10.3 billion. So I'll let that sink in just a little bit. And for that $10.3 billion, if we have a situation where you're inaccessible, then you're simply missing out on that $10.3 billion. In fact, again, according to this research, more than 70% of the internet sites that the people surveyed um, try to use have some type of critical accessibility blocker. And so they're either unable to register for the site or they're unable to um, you know, purchase or pay or whatever type of, of e-commerce transaction they're trying to do, they're unable to complete it. So if we look at that 70% of the, the, the 10 point some odd billion market, if you're an inaccessible e-commerce retailer, you could be losing out on up to 6.9 billion annually. And I want to point out there's a note on the bottom of this slide. Um, HomeDepot.com reported an annual revenue of 6.94 billion in 2018. So we're talking about an entire major company's e-commerce um, receipts being equal to 
what inaccessibility could be costing your company. And the biggest part of this research pointed out that when people can't complete a transaction with one company, they don't abandon the purchase. They buy from somewhere else. So not only are you passing up the opportunity to do business with these folks, you're giving your competitors that business by default because they are unable to complete these transactions uh, when they try to do them online for e-commerce. So significant numbers to think of when you think about the total market of over 10 billion and 6.9 billion a year that could be lost because of the 70% some odd of internet sites that have critical accessibility blockers. So overall, those some, some big numbers to think about in terms of market share in e-commerce and certainly things that should be discussed as you're planning out your accessibility journey and your accessibility program and numbers that you can use to go back to your boardroom and demonstrate the potential upside of being accessible. And everybody wants more market share, everybody wants more profitability. So I would expect that people are going to listen, especially to numbers like those ones that I just shared with you. The next example I wanna talk about are operational costs. So it, it costs money to run a business, most certainly. And in many businesses, they are breaking those costs out using business intelligence data so they can understand you know, how they can maximize their various channels uh, to conduct their business. And so this is, I you know, talked about the omni-channel organization earlier. And in an omni-channel organization, everybody wants to push their work to the digital channel. In fact, I've got a, a very good example here of, um, you know, we've all been bribed over the years to go paperless um, and then, you know, perhaps get some percentage off of our bill or some $5 rebate or something like that. Well, the reason companies are doing this is because it's cheaper to email that statement than it is to create paper and, and mail it out. Much cheaper, in fact. Um, a good example I can think of here recently is, uh, I believe, Verizon. Um, if you are going to, you know, set up a new phone or you're going to trade in a phone and get a new phone, I believe if you walk into one of their, their Verizon stores, your activation fee is $40. If you conduct your transaction online, e-commerce with ClickIn, your activation fee is only $20. So a major difference between the activation fees, you know, cut by half basically, because Verizon realizes that it is much more efficient and effective and cost effective to utilize that digital channel. So when companies analyze these things, they typically will look at all the different types of, of transactions they may conduct. And for this example, I'm just going to choose one typical transaction of make a payment. So this could apply to retail, um, it could apply to banking, um, all kinds of financial services. So hopefully this example works for, for many of you. The four different channels in question here for this particular organization are walk-in, which would be a brick and mortar staff facility, call-in, which would be brick and mortar staffed call center, or sometimes these are distributed call centers. We see more and more call centers operating with remote employees. Mail-in, which is another brick and mortar facility, which is a staffed mail processing center. And if you've ever been in a, a mail processing center, you've seen the expensive mechanical equipment that exists there and, and can imagine what costs it entails to run that operation. And then finally, click-in, which is our virtual digital website transaction. So looking at the cost of making a payment, we can see that it would be $15 for somebody to make a payment in a walk-in office by the time you take all costs into consideration, $7.50 for call-in, $2.50 for mail-in, and $0.50 cents for click-in. Now, all companies have targets of what they would like to see in this mix of their omni-channel organization. For walk-in, a good target would be 5%. You know, we don't want to see that type of traffic, particularly with banks. You know, banks try to minimize your visit to the actual facility. They want to conduct most of their business with you, you know, online if they can. Call in at a target of 15%, mail in a target of 20%, and then click in a target of 60% because again, digital channel, most efficient, easiest to maintain, easiest to do business in for the company. But the actual is usually the inverse. So actual 60% for walk-in, 20% for call-in, 15% for mail-in, and maybe 5% for click-in because this particular business hasn't yet created a model that reduces costs for the click-in option. So taking that payment, that make a payment transaction, and we're gonna be very conservative here too, so I'm 
I'm talking about 1.5 million payments a month, which for some companies is more like 1.5 million pay payments a day. And for some companies <laughs> could be 1.5 million payments per hour. But we'll just use this to keep the numbers from, from being too fantastic. Um, so walk in at 60% with a per unit cost of $15 would yield us $13.5 million for those 1.5 million payments over a month. Call in at 20%, again, I'm using the actuals here, at 750 is 2.2 million. Mail in at 15% is about half a million. And then click in at a per unit cost of only 50 cents each is about 37,500. So for this particular company taking 1.5 million payments per month, across all the different channels they offer, their total cost is 16.35 million. Now what we look at is we've done some accessibility improvements. And these accessibility improvements that we've done have suddenly opened up our digital channel to people who couldn't use the digital channel before. So perhaps they wanted to use digital, but they couldn't. And they had to use walk-in, click-in, or mail-in. And we've been conservative here too. So thinking about those statistics I quoted earlier, you know, 20 or 30% working age people with disabilities in the US population, we're only gonna look at a potential 10% of that. So we're going to say that if we make the click-in channel accessible, that maybe half of the people who could utilize it might actually utilize it. So using this and then making an assumption that we're dropping off 3.33% in all the other channels, which likely, there's gonna be one channel that reduces more than others, which is likely gonna be walk-in. And then adding that 10% to click in, we can see from those totals now at 56%, 16% for call-in, 11% for mail-in, and 15% for click-in, the total processing is now down to 15.187 million. So just with that slight accessibility improvement or the ability for some people to use the internet or use the digital channel for just that one transaction, we can see a decrease has already occurred of 1.162 million a month. So before accessibility improvements, when people were blocked, 16.35 million. After accessibility improvements, when people are able to make a payment online, and then only considering that 10% of the people would do that, the monthly savings is 1.162, and then annual savings, $13.95 million. So at 1.5 million transactions a month for these costs, for a minimal change, we can see that the annual savings for this single transaction, and, and I'm sure your e-commerce sites are much more active than just a single transaction, that's more money than most people spend on their accessibility program in two or three years. So excellent information to take back when you're looking for funding and looking for positive impact and, and, and letting people know that there is this potential for return on investment and that we can plan for this type of uptick in the digital channel if we make it available to more people who in fact probably are more easily able to use the digital channel than some of the other channels due to their disability. Another interesting tidbit, this is again from the Nucleus study, is that internet users who are blind call a customer's, uh, I'm sorry, a company's customer service department an average of once a week because of website accessibility issues. 90% uh, of the interviewees reported that they regularly called customer service multiple times to report an issue, even though they had already abandoned the transaction. So if you have problems with accessibility in your digital channel, you are pushing more calls and more traffic and more work to certainly what's a more expensive channel with your, um, your call center. So just another interesting tidbit on, on what happens when we don't see accessibility there. And you can imagine how that would affect this chart if I go back to those 1.5 million payments a month to push those the other way, especially if there's multiple calls. So take a quick breather here for me and, and talk about risk management. Um, this is one that I've talked about before. In fact, I talked about it out at CSUN. Uh, so I do want to cover it again here because even though this is what a lot of people focus on, it's still very important. And um, it's still um, a source of damages and loss of money to companies, particularly when you start thinking about brand image um, and company core values, which is what we'll cover um, in the very end. But from a risk management perspective, what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that if we get a complaint, 
that we handle that complaint quickly with empathy, with speed, with understanding, with caring, so that it doesn't evolve into a lawsuit. Um, the best way to do that is not to have the complaint in the first place, which would be you know, being accessible, but that's not always possible. Certainly everybody makes mistakes and we all have defects on our websites. So there are some strategies for, for helping with the complaints and then avoiding the lawsuits. But what I'm gonna talk about now is just to give you a basic idea of how much those complaints and lawsuits can actually cost you when you take into account all the work that must occur when you get a complaint or when you're served with a lawsuit. First off, I'll give just a very quick update on the uh, web accessibility lawsuit uh, environment. And I, I know you've probably all seen these numbers before. They come from the same source, so there's nothing different. And, and many of you might have seen them at CSUN or other um, opportunities to, to get out and learn about accessibility. But the uh, accessibility related lawsuits have exploded 181% increase from 2017 to 2018. Um, and, and what's going on with this? There's, there's really a couple of things probably. Number one is that, you know, the digital channel is becoming more important to everybody, both companies and customers or prospective customers. Number two, we do see what I like to call some, some predatory litigation in this space. So we see companies um, who are being filed with demand letters or lawsuits that really are just looking for some type of a settlement. But within these numbers, there are tons of legitimate customers or legitimate prospective customers who are simply trying to use a company's products or services. So it's, it's not all, um, you know, the ambulance chasing type lawsuits. Um, a lot of it is, is real people trying to do real things, but we're seeing that increase and we're also seeing, you know, that, that predatory litigation increase as well. So where are these things occurring? Well, they're actually occurring every, everywhere. Um, there's two states that kind of stand out, Florida um, and New York. And there's been a lot of, I think, thought about, you know, why particular states, uh, why particular jurisdictions are getting more lawsuits than other. And, and I think a lot of that aligns to either the location of the plaintiffs or the location of the law firms. And sometimes, you know, the predisposition of, of the judiciary in those areas to allow these lawsuits to go forward. So um, everybody knows when you think about different district courts across the United States, some of them lean some one direction, some of them lean another, um, and certainly we see people filing jurisdictions that they think they may have a chance of succeeding. So 726 accessibility lawsuits in, in 2018, um, and this is just before the end of the year, so these numbers are probably in finalized, but 726 in Florida, 142 in New York, um, 61 average cases in Florida um, filed per month and 123 for New York. And then 32% of lawsuits that came from each state in 2018. So 32% of all lawsuits coming from Florida and the other 64% coming from New York. And who's being sued? Um, the other thing we've seen is there are some trends in this space as well. So we tend to see a bunch of retail lawsuits grouped or maybe banking and financial lawsuits grouped. And again, this has to do with the increasing utilization of the digital channel um, and people, you know, not being um, served appropriately, as well as this, this grouping of the predatory litigation. But it's actually hitting all over the place. You know, retail, food service, travel, hospitality, banking, entertainment, self-service, you name it. And we've probably seen a lawsuit out there in the last couple of years um, for that particular industry. So what's the potential cost of, of a complaint? Let's talk about the complaints first and then we'll talk about lawsuits. So a complaint is somebody has called in and they've said, I can't do X or Y or Z on your website and I'd like to be able to do that. So what do we have to do to resolve that complaint? Um, I've used some blended rates um, for calculating dollars here. And the blended rate that I've used for this one is $120 per hour. Now, there was a lot of questions about the blended rates I used out at CSUN. Um, these are just representative. Certainly, if, you know, if you're using this information, use the hourly rate information that you have available. Many people told me that, that both the one for the complaints and particularly the one for the lawsuits was too low, but I absolutely invite you to increase those if you need to. Again, I didn't want the numbers to just look ridiculous. I wanted to try to make them realistic. Um, so blended rate of $120 an hour, and who do we have participating in the complaint? 
So we've got the call center personnel and perhaps call center management who took the call. We've got compliance or regulatory personnel who then have to um, process the call. We've got product management. The reason we have product management is because we don't want to just you know, resolve the issue for the person temporarily. We want to go back and fix it. So we've got to get back into product management, get the fix prioritized. We've got developers who have to you know, correct the code or write new code. We've got quality assurance and testing. So QA and testing, you know, before we go back to production and then, and then deployment and operations as well. So what might some of these things cost? And this is a big chart. I'm not going to try to read the whole thing to everybody. Again, you'll, you'll get all this. Uh, we're going to send a copy of the accessible presentation out to everybody um, after everybody who's on the call after we get done here. But just looking at a few of these. So what we're doing is, is calculating how many people are participating, you know, how many hours per participant you know, might that require, and then the total hours, and then the extended cost is figured off of the total hours plus the blended rate of $120 per hour. So just quickly going through the actions. Again, we've got the, the call center email chat receipt. We've got the accommodation. So when somebody calls in, the very first thing you're gonna wanna do, especially if they're trying to make a payment or they're trying to get something that perhaps is being offered for a limited time on sale, you wanna make sure the customer is made whole. So we've got to make sure we accommodate them right off the bat. Then we have to document the issue, process it. We've got to spool up a project to fix it, or we have to interrupt a project that's already running. And then we have the common uh, software development lifecycle activities after that, design, code, QA, and then issue. And we've got to spool the project back down if we set up one specifically. We need to follow up with the customer. Um, and this is one that, that not everybody you know, does well. I think once we accommodate them, when we say we're going to fix it, but it's really best practice to go back after it's fixed to have that customer, you know, examine it again and make sure that they're able to do what they're trying to do on your site. So we've got some scale factors in here. We've added this, this design versus product defect. So what I, what I mean here is that if I capture a defect in the phase in which it occurs, so say I have a design document and I forgot to put uh, the markup on it for color contrast. But if I catch that in my design review, I can go back and I can spend a little bit of time and I can add that color contrast markup so that when I get to development, it's developed with the correct color palette. So the difference that we've seen historically, and there's an IBM study that talks about this, is if that defect that's introduced in design makes it all the way to production, and it's in production or maintenance phase, you know, whatever you like to call it, it can cost up to a hundred times more to fix it. And it costs a hundred times more to fix it because you're having to go through the whole process disruptively. Again, you may be having to start up an entire separate project to do that. So the proactive fixed cost for something that's caught, let's say in the design phase would be about a hundred dollars. And we're just looking at a short amount of time, again, based on those, those hourly rates we had there. The reactive fixed loss at a hundred times would be almost $10,000. So if you look at 100 complaints per year and the activities required to address those complaints, that could be costing you as much as a million dollars a year. Now, not every reactive fixed loss is going to be $10,000, but if just a few of them are $10,000, that's still going to add up to $100,000 very quickly. So once again, we can see that by being accessible, you can avoid all of these costs and save yourselves that money. So 100 complaints a year might be considered a lot for some companies, 100 complaints a year. We've seen that with some companies. So it's probably a, a pretty good average to look at and a pretty good um, reaction or amount of money that's gonna be spent you know, to address those issues. Now let's talk about the lawsuit. So we had, potentially maybe $100,000 a year to deal with those 100 complaints um, because we were gonna go back and fix the things. But we've got a completely different animal with a lawsuit. And so when we talk about a lawsuit, I've increased the blended rate per hour. Now I'm up to $225 an hour. And I'm up at that rate because we've got different people involved. For this one, anytime we've got legal action, certainly senior company leadership's gonna be involved, compliance of regulatory people, again, and then we've got our internal legal counsel. And then I don't know very many companies, or I guess I, I'm probably not aware of an example where a company that's, that's um, you know, under suit hasn't filed or hasn't hired 
an external legal counsel as well. So you have an internal legal counsel, your legal support, your subject matter experts, then your external subject matter experts as well. Your centralized accessibility team leadership is going to be involved. And again, because you're going to have to fix things here, developers, quality assurance, testing, deployment operations, and possibly marketing as well. So why are the lawsuits more expensive? Um, number one, for um, those resources that we're involving, more resources, more expensive resources. But also, a lawsuit demands a protracted response. So you're going to have additional activity, and it's going to be elongated activity, and, and it's going to be burdensome for your company. It's going to involve those senior levels of your company when they're talking about aggregate risk. And generally, it's going to call for this outside counsel representation. Now, here's another big chart. And this chart is covering what type of activities take place during a lawsuit. Now, these are fairly typical for every company. You might call them something different in your company, but I almost guarantee you they're going to occur. So you're going to have lawyers assigned and businesses notified. You're going to retain an outside counsel, which this is probably, again, a, a low estimate, $150,000. You're going to have communication to everybody involved. And then you're going to have to do some things specific to a lawsuit. You're going to have hold order processing. So there's immediately going to be a hold order put on all kinds of documentation and emails and procedures and processes and guidelines and standards, things that may be ordered during discovery um, for pre-discovery or discovery during the trial. Um, outside counsel documents, your outside counsel is going to have to be briefed in on all this stuff. So you're going to have to prepare um, a lot of information for them. Uh, initial discovery if ordered by the judge, and I do know there are some judges that order very early discovery, so now we've got to take all that information and ship it up and get it out so that the judge um, and the plaintiff and plaintiff's counsel can see some of that information, that early discovery. There's going to be status meetings that have to occur, and these are going to probably include your senior people, your internal counsel, your external counsel. Uh, prep for court status hearings, that has to be done every time. Prep for negotiation. And then negotiation itself. And the reason I have prep for negotiation and negotiation here is because this particular example is an example of one of those frivolous lawsuits. I won't call it a frivolous lawsuit because there were some issues involved, but it, it was a lawsuit that was simply filed to get some type of settlement. So the totals I'm going to give you here are for a very simple lawsuit and one of those, those quickly settled lawsuits as well. So we look at Additional activities of settlement draft, the draft review by everybody involved, the finalization, processing, and then you got to go back after you're done and release the holdovers you have on all those documents, which is going to take time by everybody involved again. And then finally, you're going to close the project and file and document. So looking across all of these activities, again, at the $225 an hour blended rate for this particular group of people, we come up with a grand total of $356,000, uh, 356,775 to be exact. And again, this is, this is almost $400,000 for a fairly simple lawsuit that, that may have been in play for six to eight to 10 to 12 weeks, maybe before a settlement was reached and the suit was, was dropped. So an immense amount of money to pay for a single lawsuit if you get into that type of situation. Now, if you have a lawsuit that actually goes to trial, then this cost pales in comparison. You're talking probably millions of dollars um, and probably months and months of work and disruption for your company. So some fairly, some fairly large costs to think about, and, and maybe the first time some of you have seen examples of what actually happens when you have complaints and lawsuits and take them through these process, but Again, I encourage you to apply you know, your hourly rates to this, and maybe you've got some different processes that you can estimate and add into these tables to go back and say you know, more concretely to folks at your company that you know, in, avo in avoiding a lawsuit, I really want to demonstrate to you what we're actually avoiding. So finally, in uh, uh, the last segment of return on investment, is alignment with core values. So it's the right thing to do. And when I say core values, I really mean the core values of your company. Um, and most companies have core values that talk about things like inclusivity, um, ease of use, 
um, always there, you know, things of this manner. In fact, I collected some um, mottos, and I'm not going to say who these are. If you use Google, you can figure them out very quickly, but just a few mottos that are out there. So here to help life go right. You're in good hands with, and that's probably the easiest one, um, life's better when we're connected. Our client's interests always come first, leading the way, where there's a helpful smile in every aisle. Considering that your website is actually an aisle for your company, especially if you're retail. Our vision is to be Earth's most customer-centric company. That's one of my favorites. Um, and then be what's next. So with all these models out there and, and what companies you know, say they wanna be and how they want to partner with people, if your mission is to be inclusive, connected, customer-driven, simple, helpful, customer-centric, how can accessibility not be a part of that? How can you have a company model of that type and be excluding or potentially exclude a significant portion of the population of people who wants to do business with your company. So just a really, really interesting, um, I guess, collection of words here to look at. And, and I just picked a few. You can go out and look at models for company. I mean, again, Google's your friend here. And when you see those, you're gonna think, you know, accessibility is, is part of this. Um, an interesting story that I ran upon while creating this too was, you know, what companies are trying to do and, and what they're, they're trying to be to the rest of the world. And this story was in the Washington Post um, yesterday, the day before, but there was, and this is the name of the story actually. Uh, so a group of top CEOs says maximizing shareholder profits no longer can be the primary goal of corporations. I should read that one again. That's a pretty good one. So a group of top CEOs says maximizing shareholder profits no longer be the primary goal of corporations, which is an interesting statement by a group of top CEOs. We all know that maximizing shareholder profits has driven many companies to do many interesting things in the last 10 or 15 years since this kind of became the driving factor. However, social justice causes are on the rise. And when I say social justice, I think everybody knows what I'm talking about. Again, Google's your friend here, but um, and again, I'm not gonna, not gonna name these companies, but we do know that some te tech companies have faced pushbacks um, against contracts with immigration and border control agencies related to what's going on at the United States border at the current time. We've also seen retailers face calls to halt firearm sales. And you, certainly you've seen the stories recently um, that might lead to this. And we've seen increasingly vocal calls on social issues just across the board. So racism, LGBTQ plus equality, people with disabilities equality, ageism, all of these things that lead people to perhaps not want to do business with your company, if you are mistreating someone or if your views are not lined up. And when I say mistreating someone, so if you're ignoring a segment of the population or you're minimizing the needs um, of a population, there are some people who will choose to do business with your competitors for that very reason. In fact, consumers are increasingly looking to spend money with companies that share their views. And again, I encourage you to go out and look at that Washington Post story and do some additional searching, um, but there are many, many examples that I that I could have included here, but I, I didn't I didn't grab more, you know, due to time in the presentation here. But and that goes the same for all of these topics. There's a lot of information you can get, and I encourage you, you know, to send me questions or send questions in through whatever channel DQ has available uh, for things. And, and we could talk about what you want to talk about, but there's a lot that can add to this. And those four aspects of return on investment are something that you can use today to help get your program or get your practice funded, recognized, and, and increase the value proposition of what you're doing for accessibility. And now I'll take a big breath and turn it over to Laura for questions. Thanks, Greg. Um, I have one just as people are putting their questions into uh, the Zoom webinar, which is which of the four options do you find works the best um, when you're starting conversations um, in your consulting practices? Yeah, so works the best. I mean, that's a, I, I guess I would, I would ask a question on top of say works the best for what, but I'll just, I'll go with what you got there. The, obviously the, the number one, one that people think about right now is the litigation angle um, because of the litigation increase and because it's getting 
so much press. So in terms of, of getting something kicked off, if you need something, you know, very, you know, high value, I mean, how do you put a price on a company's brand image, right? It's very difficult to do. Um, so that's the one that I see lots of companies starting to take action on. And then when they get going, the, the second one that I see people talking about most recently is that, that market share and e-commerce information. So I guess if I were, my order of preference is market share e-commerce, um, then, you know, perhaps litigation after that, but I, I think it's reversed right now, Laura. Great, thanks. I um, have another question related to the, the lawsuit statistics that you shared. So um, are the lawsuits related uh, mainly to private websites or government websites? You know, if they break it down um, in a matrix to show the different um, market segments. Um, you know, I, I don't know. We'll have to get out with that one. I, most of the examples that, that I've seen and I've used are public companies. Although we do know, so just a, another plug on the, the Archer research, part of what we got there is that, that people feel so disconnected from the political process because of, of accessibility issues in that. So registering to vote, um, getting information online about bills and things like that, they, they feel a bit disenfranchised. So I'll say that the, the government is growing. I don't have a good example of a lawsuit there. So most of these have to do with public companies. But the dissatisfaction with government and the pressure to improve those those e services from the government is there as well. Great, thanks. I have another question here. Um, do, does DQ offer a scorecard or accessibility ROI scorecard assessment through contracting with us or for free? Yeah, we do. So at at DQ we have what we call our accessibility program office, and there's a number of services associated with that. But really what we're, what we're trying to do there is we help people mature their programs is this, this measure. So measure what's going on, you know, understand it. What I really want to find and what we've yet to find yet, so full disclosure on that, is a good example of somebody's market share expanding or e-commerce changing um, because of the accessibility change that we made. We know that's occurring. Um, but it's really hard to nail that stuff down. So we do offer consulting on all of these things and would be happy um, to help people prioritize, to put their own data in these things. You know, we actually provide a, a good starter package where we can analyze the maturity of your processes and then show you through maturing, you know, different verticals throughout accessibility, how that can affect the bottom line and how that can improve the things we've just talked about. Great, thanks. Um, so someone asked a question, is if they if uh, attendees are going to be able to receive a copy of the presentation yes we're going to send that out um, to folks with the recording afterwards but another question here so kimberly asked when a company is starting to plan um, your business either a web or app for instance how do they ensure that their new site is fully accessible are there development companies that specialize in this so uh, are there development companies that specialize in this and I don't know that there's a there's a an agency perhaps you know if you were trying to get somebody to you know develop your content for you that specializes in accessibility um, up front I do know that more and more these agencies or content development companies are focusing on accessibility as a core concern for the content they develop so if you're a company and you're starting out and you're relying on other people to to um, create this content for you um, I would definitely urge you to make sure that your contracts include accessibility as a requirement. Um, and we have, you know, another service from the APO that can help you do that as well, the contract boilerplate language and work language and stuff like that. So hopefully that answered that question. Great, thanks. Um, so William is asking a question as it relates to litigation and, and uh, complaints and lawsuits, is what is the biggest concern? Um, basically, is it, is it that the user is unable to perform um, key workflows or user flows? or is it kind of nitpicky down to things like color contrast ratios, et cetera? Yeah, William, that's a good question. I mean, the best examples I've seen um, of, of, I'll call it again, real litigation, a customer trying to do something and they can't do it. Um, I, I've got an example where a, a person was working with an investment house and they had accessibility in their, um, in their website. So they were able to invest and do market research and things like that. And then, that company was bought by another company 
and they moved to the other company's website and then suddenly she didn't have access anymore. So she worked to do it again. And then that company was subsequently bought by a third company and they moved her again and, and did it again. So in, in that instance, what she was trying to do was simply continue her investing. You know, she wanted to be able to do market research and move her money around and purchase shares and sell just like everybody else. So in the, in, in the, the real cases, I'll say that most people are very focused on whatever business transaction they can't do. However, when you see those, those lawsuits filed, they typically cover everything under the sun. So they'll talk about what they weren't able to do, but basically it'll be like reading a, a list of WCAG, so Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, success criteria down through there. And those website, I'm sorry, those lawsuits that are, um, you know, the, the predatory ones that I talked about, almost every time they'll just list the general WCAG criteria and not really even give you an example of what the, the consumer the customer or the potential customer was unable to do. So you, you very different. And if you go out and read some of those lawsuits, you can you can tell the ones that have you know a real concerned person behind them pretty quickly uh, from that. Because the other ones are are a little bit cookie cutter in what they do. They just list all the success criteria and say you're not meeting any of them. Great. Um, so we have another question here as related to lawsuits. Asking is WCAG the guidelines which um, mostly come up in these complaints and lawsuits, and does the DOJ acknowledge WCAG, and how much deviation is allowed? Okay, so um, full disclosure here: I don't study litigation overseas, so the the litigation that I'm focused on right now is U.S. based, and so it is WCAG within that. In fact, we've seen through a preponderance of lawsuits filed as well as cases in which the Department of Justice has become an interested party, or where we have a, a DOJ-backed consent decree, typically it's WCAG 2.0, levels A plus double A, that are specified. Now I'll say the preponderance of evidence there because what we don't have is we don't have any case law yet, right? There's, there's one um, actual full-blown lawsuit that went all the way through. Um, this is Winn-Dixie, and it's under appeal right now, but we don't have any actual case law that's established that standard. That being said, WCAG 2.0 A plus AA seems to be the target for all of the legislation that we have seen. Now, I will say that in a few instances, so a few times um, since WCAG 2.1 came out, we've seen WCAG 2.1 mentioned as well. In terms of what the Department of Justice looks for, again, if you, if you go out and look at cases and you look at Department of Justice consent decrees, and there's a number of them out there to check out, they typically have been looking at WCAG 2.0 A plus AA. Now, that's in some type of settlement or consent. Within the Americans with Disabilities Act itself, there's still no specific guideline. In fact, it doesn't specifically say that a website is a place of public accommodation. So what the, the law says is that if you have a place of public accommodation, then you must provide accessibility. That's, that's what it says. So usually what's being litigated first is not WCAG, it's whether or not ADA Title III applies to the business that's being sued. That was a long answer, so hopefully that got to what they were asking, but it's a very, it's very complex, it's very interesting to study. Um, it's sad to study sometimes because I think, you know, lawsuits can drive um, good behavior and they can also drive bad behavior, and, and I think we're seeing some bad behavior right now, and, and I'm hoping to see that trend change. Speaking of bad behavior, Greg, what do you estimate Domino's is spending to avoid um, practicing accessibility as they elevate it to the um, Supreme Court? Yeah, what they're what they're spending or what they're going to spend? Um, uh, both, yes. Yeah, so what they're spending is hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, probably several million dollars. The 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 big question here comes out is is which way will the Supreme Court go on this, right? I mean, we've got, um, you know, three new appointees to the court recently, two new, very recent, um, and, and it's shifted a little bit more conservative. And so if you look at conservative interpretations of that law, because it doesn't specifically say, you know, websites, and doesn't talk about mobile, and, and the reason it doesn't say that is because it's written before these things, you know, essentially existed for e-commerce, um, we're liable to see a ruling come out that says, you know, 
it doesn't apply. I mean, you know, hope not to see something like that um, because in my mind and in everybody's mind who likes to use the digital channel, I think it certainly should apply. But um, they're, they're really, they're, they're playing a risky game. I guess I would put it that way. You know, we get a ruling one way or the other, but I, I still think even with the makeup of the court right now that there's, uh, there's probably not enough there to say that we should, you know, on purpose exclude people um, because there's not enough specificity in the, in the law. But of course it's, you know, the Supreme Court's there to, to rule, not make law. So it'll be interesting to see, but certainly with, with all the moves they're taking right now, they're in the millions of dollars being spent when, you know, for a few million dollars, they could just fix everything. So not sure on the strategy there. There's been lots of companies, I think. So this goes back again to, to the litigation that's more this, you know, people looking for a settlement. So while that's driving companies to, to move towards accessibility, it's also driving businesses, and rightly so, to say that this litigation is just designed to squeeze money out of us. They don't really want to improve anything. They just want us to settle and give them some type of money. And that's, I mean, in any, any situation you talk about, any, any law or enforcement law, you really don't ever want to see it enforced through litigation because um, it puts a negative connotation with it. I would like to see all valid lawsuits from real customers or prospective customers trying to do real things. And you get all these other lawsuits clogging it up. Um, and that's why, you know, the Supreme Court's liable to go the other direction. It's a, it's a bad situation. Thanks, Greg. That was a great answer. Um, switching gears here, you know, I think a lot of people are wondering maybe, you know, wh how is, what is the best way to get started when trying to tackle accessibility? Do you have any quick tips for people as they're trying to start their accessibility practices? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So there's, I mean, I think we've proven over the last few years or the last five years or so that to, to jump in and to start fixing everything, now you'll hear people refer to it as remediation, um, is, is not necessarily the best way to go. I, I think if somebody was starting out right now, um, what I would recommend to them is getting, you know, a good idea of what they're trying to fix. And then they can start to fix those things. We, we call that stopping the bleeding. But the really important thing to do is when you think about the software development lifecycle as a continuity from left to right, so left being design and right being production, is to start to change the processes. So inject accessibility into design first. Inject accessibility into development second. Um, use automation. So lots of issues, tons of issues can be found for automation very quickly and cheaply and corrected in that manner. So, so start small and, and iterate up through, but make sure that you're addressing where the issues are coming from so that you're not simply trying to fix them after you've created them and put them into production. We see a lot of people make that mistake. It's a very costly process to go through fixing things at the end over and over again. Um, but by starting, you know, DQ calls that shift left. By starting to the left um, and equipping your designers and your developers and your QA people um, with the tools that they need to, to inject accessibility in their phase, it's much cheaper and it gets you to what we call sustainability. So at, at one point in time, we weren't developing secure code, Laura, and it was this type of activity. And now people just develop secure code by default. It's part of something you do. And that's really where we want to see accessibility get to as well as just being part of what you do when you develop content for your digital presence. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I want to switch gears here. So this is a tough question Michael is asking, but I think it's a good question is, in your opinion, what is the best way to handle third party features or content that may have accessibility issues? And I think that specifically is probably being asked in the context of, are you res legally responsible for that content as well? Um, the short answer there is that yes, you're legally responsible for that. And, and, um, I haven't seen an example where somebody has been able to say, oh, that's not, you know, the WashingtonPost.com's content. That's, you know, Bob's content developer <laughs> content. And you have to talk to Bob about that. So if you've, if you've branded it and you're using it, um, you have the responsibility for it. And people aren't going to think about, you know, Bob's content.com. They're going to think about your company.com. And a great example of this, if you think back to um, Target, and when Target had that, and this is not even an accessibility example, but it's a good example. So they had a, 
they had a, a breach and lost a bunch of, I think, debit cards or, um, you know, credit information. The reason they had that is because there was a security breach in their, their HVAC. So in their heating and cooling systems that jumped across from one network to another. So who was responsible for that? Well, Target was responsible for that. I don't know the name of the HVAC company, do you? <laughs> but I do know that, that Target was responsible for that. So you're gonna be responsible for it. And in terms of trying to handle those things, again, we talked about this earlier, use your contract language to do that. Have accessibility clauses that you put in your master agreements. Have accessibility requirements and validation that you put in your work orders so that when those people deliver content to you, it's already been certified for accessibility. Great. Um, another question here. So, you know, when it comes to accessibility, there are multiple tools, um, system technology tools and browser combinations, um, such as JAWS, NVDA, Chrome, Internet Explorer, et cetera. Is it required to be, um, are companies required to be ADA compliant for all of these combinations? Or is there a specific combination that will suffice? Yeah, so we haven't seen a, a browser slash assistive technology um, system that's come from any requirement. Um, so, so I would say that there's, there's not one that's preferred over the other. Um, so there's no requirement there. But also, you know, you're not expected to support every browser in the universe and every, you know, brand off, one off tool in the universe for assistive technologies either. Um, so, you know, I think somebody listed JAWS and NVDA. So what companies will do is they'll decide, they'll say, well, I'm going to test on common browsers. So let's say Safari, Chrome, um, Internet Explorer, and I'm going to test with NVDA. And that's what I'll certify to. Now, that doesn't mean it won't work with some other browser and JAWS, but that means that that's what you're using to validate it. And you really have to try to get yourself a, just a good combination where you're not in overkill mode, you know, trying to cover all those. And it's really a company by company decision, just like, you know, typically on a website, it'll say this website works best with, you know, XYZ. You can do that same thing. And, and usually if people are having problems in, in an older browser or something like that, you know, you're not going to be responsible. They need to update to the latest version. Or if it works better in another browser, you can suggest that's very simple for somebody to switch from one zero cost browser to another. So does that cover it, Laura? Yep, that's great. Thanks, Greg. Um, we've actually come to the end of our time. Um, so I'm going to say thank you to Greg for such a great presentation and for taking time to answer all of the questions. If we didn't get to you, you know, feel free to email me and I'll pass that along to Greg. And um, don't forget that we'll be sending out the presentations and recording by email, so keep an eye out for that. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your Tuesday. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it.